stop it. You have your whole life ahead of you. The Tolstoy Diaries, episode three, the third episode. Welcome back. Um, I just crossed over into the 700 page mark. We are now more than halfway through this monster and I just had to stop reading. I was gonna keep going. I was trying to get to page like 706, but um, I was actually just starting to feel so much anxiety because I'm now on book three, part one, chapter 15 and we're back on the battle, we're back in war. Um, and it's just giving me a lot of anxiety because I know something is coming and I'm just really scared about it. And so it was kind of similar to what happened to me when I got to the end of book one of War and Peace. I got so much, it just gave me so much anxiety um, reading about the war and stuff like that and I know I just can kind of feel it that something is gonna happen I don't know I don't know I don't know what's gonna happen I do not know the story at all and so just getting 700 pages of the way through now something I know listen I just know something's gonna happen so I'm just I'm not ready for it yet so I'm just gonna take a break but um like I said I'm now 700 pages through which means I crossed over into book three the end of book two can we just talk about this for a second um we get to the scene with Pierre and Andre and Natasha and my feelings towards all the characters have changed drastically which is incredible but with Pierre we got to the scene with Pierre and Natasha and those were kind of the first lines I had heard read from War and Peace when I first watched the Dickens versus Tolstoy debate, um, the one on YouTube by um, Square, Intelligent Squared. Um, and it was just so good because you have like Tom Hiddleston yelling um, at Natasha, stop, you have your whole life ahead of you or before you. Um, and I just like hear that. I like need that as an alarm. Consider me your friend. Stop it, stop it. You have your whole life ahead of you. I need that in my life. When I'm having a panic attack, I need Tom Hiddleston yelling at me to stop. I have my whole life ahead of me. Especially the whole thing with the Comet of 1812. Oh my gosh. I was also listening to the soundtrack of the musical, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. Oh, so good, but like where I am now, I'm not ready for it. I'm not ready for it. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit down with you guys, take you through what's been going on, what I've been enjoying, what I haven't been enjoying, who we're rooting for, um, and just all the things that have gone into the Tolstoy Diaries so far. So I'm not ready to have my heart broken anymore or cry because last Tolstoy Diary episode was just a sobbing fest. Um, sorry about that one, but you know, so yeah, okay, let's just go to chat because I'm not ready for it. Hey. Welcome back to the Tolstoy Diaries. Um, I'm really trying not to greet you with tears right now because I just finished another section of this and then I just started crying. I've now got done crying and I'm back to open up another episode of War and Peace, reading War and Peace. Um, yeah, I think that was the third time now that I've just completely broken down over this book. Not been super okay. <laughs> just spent a little while sitting in my reading chair crying. Um, one thing that I just have to say right off the bat is that I would highly recommend if you are reading this book or if you want to read this book to read it with the soundtrack of the BBC um, TV series of War and Peace in your ears while you're reading because it just makes it 
it takes it to a whole other level. That's that's what I was doing. But let me give you some updates um, and we can just talk about some stuff. There's definitely a lot that I have to talk about in here. So this first update is up to page 578, which is book two, part five. So if you are reading along with us for the book club and you don't want to be spoiled or if you just don't want to hear anything i will make sure to give you page numbers but this one's about pierre pierre is definitely becoming a new favorite character especially because i've read some later parts as well and oh my goodness but this one was just really um hard hitting it, it is a favorite quote but it's also a lot um about everyday war and everyday life kind of thing about the monotony and the drudgery and how sometimes you can feel like you're at war with your everyday life. You can feel like you're at war with yourself or with the world around you or with society or something like that. And he says to Pierre, all men seemed like those soldiers seeking refuge from life. Some in ambition, some in cards, some in framing laws, some in women, some in toys, some in horses, some in politics, some in sport, some in wine, and some in governmental affairs. Nothing is trivial and nothing is important. It's all the same. Only to save oneself from it as best one can, thought Pierre. Only not to see it, that dreadful it. Yeah, all of our characters are just going through so many um, <laughs> levels of crisis in their own life, both with the war that's going on and with the society. Pierre is really struggling to find what he wants in life. Um, he has obviously gone through the Freemason stuff now, but he's finding more and more that he's so unhappy. His wife, Helen, is following him everywhere, and she's such in a different world than he is. She's very much like the society celebrity um she has like these soirees and these dinners and she's very much in the heights of like society um and surrounds herself with important people while pierre is just kind of sitting in the corner questioning his own life and everyone else's i think i was talking last vlog about natasha and andre and their relationship which is also incredibly interesting but unfortunately what happens um basically andre proposes to natasha but um, he has to wait a year for their engagement to, you know, be over and for them to be married because his father um, is not in agreement with Andre's choices and so he basically gives Natasha and her family free reign for her to be free during this one year of kind of a secret engagement. She's able to break it off whenever and in the meantime he goes away for his health to look after himself so he's completely out of Russia. And this is just the one- oh my gosh, it just makes me so mad. Anatole. 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 He is um, the brother of Helen as well, so he's Pierre's brother-in-law as well. And Natasha and him basically meet at the opera and then, um, if you don't want to be spoiled, skip ahead to there, but basically Anatole um, basically barges his way in, manipulates Natasha, and Natasha starts to have these super complicated feelings. She's going through so much, I just feel for her so much, and she makes some decisions and she makes some mistakes and basically what happens is that the engagement and the relationship between her and Andre is completely ruined um, and it's just such a heartbreaking moment because she's alone Prince Andre has been quite distant, remote, and just removed from her. He's honestly not treating her the best because right at the minute that he proposed to her and entered into this engagement with her, he realized that he had made a mistake himself and the minute that he asked her to marry him, he started to see her as just this strange, childlike, um, kind of annoying figure. Now that that kind of closer implication and possibility and now certainty of kind of possession and being um, in an actual relationship with Natasha is secure, suddenly all of his love for her vanishes. Um, and that's definitely one of the main reasons why I started to dislike Andre uh, more and more, even though I still think he's a really, really interesting character. He seems to be going through these cycles of repetition, repeating the same mistakes, doing the same things, and that is also heartbreaking to watch. But back to Natasha and Anatole. Basically, Anatole convinces her to elope with him and run away, and all of a sudden her reputation and her whole life is just put at stake and at risk, and um, she is saved from it, thankfully, by Sonia. But it's just such a heartbreaking scene. Like, it's so sad and definitely one of the parts that I disliked reading about the most. So far, the parts I've disliked reading the most, well, definitely this one, but like for a different reason because it's still like super important. But I really did not like the hunt scene with Nikolai and Natasha and the Rostov um, household. It's a super long drawn out scene where they go hunting and it's just really 
saddening. It made me feel so gross and so um, sick to my stomach, just the way that it was portrayed, but that also went really well hand in hand with like the war and peace and the war in everyday life. I love the fact that Pierre stopped being a cinnamon roll for one second on Natasha's behalf and like really starts to threaten Anatole. So that's kind of the update I just want to give for now, but I want to be back soon because I want to um, say a lot and I have a lot to say about the closing off of book two into book three as you can see like this whole page and these whole pages were just spectacular so I think I'll be back to talk more about that later but as for right now I'm going to pack up my things and I'm gonna go outside and maybe read some more All right, hi. So I'm back finally to talk about the little part that happens before book three because it's just um, incredible. So spoilers um, for up to book two, part five, so you can skip ahead. So basically Natasha and Pierre's relation, no, Natasha and Andre's relationship is over and Pierre comes to see Natasha because she's secluded, she's basically locked herself in her room, she's very ill, and just their conversation is so lovely. Um, it is in like the Intelligence Squared debate if you'd like to check it out between um, the two actors there. And of course she is so distraught but then Pierre is there and he's like, stop, you have your whole life before you. And she says, before me, no all is over for me and then he says all over if i were not myself but the handsomest cleverest and best man in the world and were free i would this moment ask on my knees for your hand and your love for the first time for many days natasha wept tears of gratitude and tenderness and glancing at pierre she went out of the room i've just started to feel so much more love for pierre um even though he's doing some dumb things i mean everyone's doing some dumb things and i do just feel so sorry for natasha as well um i'm really interested to see what becomes of her character because i'm honestly not sure what is going to happen um i think she has so much more to give honestly in scenes and i wish I wish there was more of a focus on her, honestly, because we get so much of Pierre and Andre and Nikolai almost, but I would just really like more of Natasha too, but this book ends with like the nicest little last scene here and the last lines with the comet, um, which is just such a perfect image. And then I think that'll take me maybe nicely into what I have to say about Tolstoy too in a second, but it just says it was clear and frosty. Above the dirty, ill-lit streets, above the black roofs, stretched the dark, starry sky. Only looking up at the sky did Pierre cease to feel how sordid and humiliating were all mundane things compared with the heights to which his soul had just been raised. At the entrance to the Arbat Square, an immense expanse of dark, starry sky presented itself to his eyes, almost in the center of it surrounded and sprinkled on all sides by stars, but distinguished from them all by its nearness to the earth. Its white light and its long uplifted tail shone the enormous and brilliant comet of the year 1812, the comet which was said to portend all kinds of woes and the end of the world. In Pierre, however, that comet with its long luminous tail aroused no feeling of fear. On the contrary, he gazed joyfully his eyes moist with tears at this bright comet, which having traveled in its orbit with inconceivable velocity through immeasurable space, seemed suddenly like an arrow piercing the earth to remain fixed in a chosen spot, vigorously holding its tail erect, shining and displaying its white light amid countless other scintillating stars. It seemed to Pierre that this comet fully responded to what was passing in his own softened and uplifted soul, now blossoming into a new life. Okay, well, all right then. Anyway, so that's good. Then we get into kind of some other things now that we're in book three, part one. Tolstoy has kind of been inserting himself in here a little, little bit, but now that we're in part one, like it's really coming through. And what I really like keeping track of with the orange tabs, like I keep saying, is that kind of puppetry that the characters all feel themselves to be under. They feel like they're not in control of their own lives. They feel like they're not the ones who are pulling out their strings. They feel like it's fate, destiny, everything has been pre-decided for them ever since their moment of birth and <laughs> long before then. But Tolstoy really starts to like come out of this hidden shell that he's been in a little bit 
as the writer but like not really but now he's like really coming out with just these really philosophical and especially um talks and speeches about determinism and stuff like that but i think a little bit of it so far because it just keeps happening it gets very repetitive it's almost like he's really hammering down the same ideal and the same thought and the same thought process of having this thought but like it's honestly not necessary because Tolstoy is so talented and like in these scenes where he's not fully there right he's just the narrator and we have the characters and they're the ones thinking these thoughts he's so good at showing us this determinism and um this fate and the almost purposeless drifting of his characters that are just being pulled by things they have no control over like it's expressed beautifully but then he'll go on these scenes um and on these long writing journeys expressing the same things but just removing uh, everything that literature dresses up points and ideas and things to discuss with and he'll just strip it down and like tell you the facts of this determinism um and of this outlook and of this fate that all his characters are hurtling towards powerless themselves no autonomy and it just seems a little bit unnecessary like i'm saying because like i get it like we get it we know you're showing us so beautifully how these characters are not in control and how history manipulates things and manipulates people and how leaders even if they think they're in control they're not really there's thousands of decisions that influence everything and so when he takes a second to like really just sit down and almost just explain it to us i'm like we don't need it we don't need you to explain you've done a beautiful job of it um and i do love the discussion but i just think if i had to say something negative about this book that's probably what i would want to discuss but um we do again enter more into like a battle um war setting in book three now so um, i just love the way he describes it so on the 12th of June, 1812, the forces of Western Europe crossed the Russian frontier and war began. That is, an event took place opposed to human reason and to human nature. Millions of men perpetrated against one another such innumerable crimes, frauds, treacheries, thefts, forgeries, issues of false money, burglaries, incendiarisms, and murders, as in whole centuries are not recorded in the annals of all the law courts of the world but which those who committed them did not at the time regard as being crimes. What produced this extraordinary occurrence? What were its causes? And then he goes on to tell us a whole bunch, like I was just talking about. And like, it's a fantastic discussion, but I just think like with the characters themselves providing this, it's almost like there's like kind of this double war and peace, one with Natasha and Pierre and Andre and the war. And then all of a sudden Tolstoy just like barges in, opens the door and he's like, oh, hey, I'm here too. Don't forget about me. I have a lot to tell you because war and peace isn't really like a novel which is something I think I want to talk about more during the live show, but it's just, um, yeah, like, like I said, he's talking about how an incalculable number of causes present themselves. The deeper we delve in search of these causes, the more of them we find, and each separate cause or a whole series of causes appears to us equally valid in itself and equally false by its insignificance compared to the magnitude of the events and by its impotence apart from the cooperation of all the other coincident causes to occasion that event. Without each of these causes, nothing could have happened. So all these causes, myriads of causes, coincided to bring it about. And so there was no one cause for that occurrence, but it had to occur because it had to. Um, I think this was kind of the first major big scene that Tolstoy comes in and starts to talk about these ideas and war especially. But then as you can see, I have read further um, and it just keeps getting more and more and bigger and bigger these scenes. And like I said, it just owes um, a little bit of what I would like to talk about if I had to talk about it in a negative way to the repetition there, I think. Every act of theirs, which appears to them an act of their own will, is in an historical sense involuntary and is related to the whole course of history and predestined from eternity we definitely had so many more scenes of just raw reality and i think probably this update i'm going to just close off with like a quote from book three part two chapter five um which is with prince andre and he's seeing his fellow soldiers and um there's just some really nice quotes. So one is talking about an old man. The old man was still sitting in the ornamental garden like a fly on the face of a loved one who is dead. Okay. And then he sees his fellow soldiers bathing and he said, all this naked white human flesh laughing and shrieking floundered about in that dirty pool like carp stuffed into a watering can. 
and the suggestion of merriment and that floundering mass rendered it specially pathetic. Like all our characters are going through these cycles, especially, well, Pierre, Pierre and Andre uh, mostly, but Natasha as well, I think they're going through these cycles of repetitive things. It, it reminds me a little bit of 100 Years of Solitude almost because like they're going through um, different ideas of like philosophy and different moods in their life, but they seem to keep making the same mistakes um, and keep entering into these extremely vicious circles, almost like a comet. Um, which is just so gorgeous. It's just so gorgeous. It's so good. So honestly, the repetitive thing I'm talking about with Tolstoy, I don't think it really matters to me because I do like reading his long-winded philosophical um, essays on like war and determinism and history and politics and how everything is just um, a cause caused by something else and you can't really affect change except in being a cause for something else. So yeah, that's just really interesting. I think it plays a lot into all the characters in War and Peace and how they affect one another. They are the causes that are affecting one another and just that image of the comet and what Pierre has to say about it and how now it's affecting all of their lives. Just brilliant. So I'm gonna go read a little bit more and then I'll be back to talk some more about this amazing book. All right, everyone, I think this is gonna be the last um, little update on War and Peace for this third episode of the Tolstoy Diaries because today I hit 1,000. I hit the 1,000th page mark, um, which is so crazy. I honestly don't know how this book is gonna end and it's really stressing me out. Like I have no clue and so much is happening, but as well in the last, I wanna say like 200 to 250 pages, it's really, it's been losing my interest a little bit. Like I haven't skipped, I'm reading every word. I'm still loving it, I'm adoring it, but just Tolstoy takes 200 pages to tell me something that could have taken honestly two pages or one, um, which is fine because it's it's really historical. It's like really historical. I'm learning so, so much, but I think just as a reader um, and someone who's not interested all the time in debating every single thing as my own personal thing, um, I just would have enjoyed it if it had been a little bit abridged i'm not gonna lie that being said the characters are just so interesting so interesting um natasha's been back a little bit we've had so many um things happen in with napoleon and with the russian side and stuff like that so i'm up to page a hundred what hundred a thousand and fourteen which is book four part one chapter four so if you've not read up to there i'm probably going to spoil some stuff so beware but basically we've just had the burning of moscow stuff is still burning pierre is currently in moscow witnessing this burning he's on like this one-man mission to kill napoleon that's what he's currently doing right now that's at the point that pierre is he has one dagger and he's gonna go find napoleon our characters are doing great prince andre is dying he's just straight up dying he's lying dying and natasha is crying over his dying body they found each other they're back in each other's party and company and i just don't know at all what's gonna happen with them um very shocking our second character death well technically our third we've actually had no one die on the battlefield which is so interesting and which is something i didn't think tolstoy would really continue with because looking back to our first character death which was prince andre's wife um lise she died in childbirth and now pierre's wife has actually just gone i believe she's committed suicide and andre's father has also died a pretty natural death from old age and sickness and none of our characters as of yet have died on the battlefield which is a thing this was an enormously beautiful scene which happened um when prince andre and august the 25th it said his thoughts the simplest clearest and therefore most terrible thoughts would give him no peace he knew that tomorrow's battle would be the most terrible of all he had taken part in, and for the first time in his life, the possibility of death presented itself to him. Vividly, plainly, terribly, and almost as a certainty. And from the height of this perception, all that had previously tormented and preoccupied him suddenly became illumined by a cold white light without shadows, without perspective, and without distinction of outline. All life appeared to him like magic lantern pictures at which he had long been gazing by artificial light through a glass. Now he suddenly saw those badly dubbed pictures in clear daylight and without a glass. And then Pierre comes back to the field and they kind of meet each other for I think what both of them assume is one of the last times and then they have another little debate again which was so, so nice. And Prince Andre goes on and he has really, really nice things to say. Um, War is not courtesy, but the most horrible thing in life. And we ought to understand that and not play at war. 
we ought to accept this terrible necessity sternly and seriously. Get rid of falsehood and let war be war and not a game. As it is now, war is the favorite pastime of the idle and frivolous. And then of course, Andre is wounded again and we just go back into this cycle of repetition, just like the comet. Um, and it's a little bit just so tragic and saddening because what is Tolstoy suggesting? Well, Andre was already wounded once, we thought he was dead. He comes back, he's full of life, he's full of happiness. He's gonna change his life, he's gonna turn it around. He proposes to Natasha. All of a sudden, all of those feelings are drained away. He's unhappy, he leaves Russia, and then he goes back to the war, then he's wounded again, then he wakes up, he's full of life, he doesn't want to die, he's reunited with Natasha. How many times do things have to happen to people before they realize what is happening to them and how to change those things? I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever gonna get there, and I really hope they do and Pierre on the other hand he's kind of doing something but maybe he's going the other way around the orbit I don't know he turned to religion he went to the Freemasons he got out of that he's so disenchanted with life he's disenchanted with his wife with society with everything he goes to war thinking that's gonna give him what he needs and what he wants but then he's like this is all disgusting what are these people doing these people are killing each other are they not gonna stop he's in the middle of this battlefield all this stuff is going on around him and he's horrified um, and then he turns more plainly to God and now he's back in Moscow and he is on a one-man mission to kill Napoleon himself and it's just no one knows what they're doing everyone's just running around scurrying around like ants being thrown by these forces of war and peace and finding peace in war and war and peace and it's just it's very good but I'm also very scared about how this book ends so like I said I did make it to page 1014 so I don't know, I think we're gonna have one more episode at least of the Tolstoy Diaries, but I'm just not sure how it's gonna end. Like, I really don't know. I'm still really liking it, but I'm just a little bit fed up with everyone at this point, honestly, and with Tolstoy, but like in a good way. So that is that. Thanks once again for coming along with us on this Tolstoy journey, this episode of the Tolstoy Diaries. So yeah, I'll see you guys very soon in my next video. I'm gonna go read some more of this, probably cry some more, but Ciao.